So Simon's going to talk about another thing now, which is about disclosure and the importance of disclosure. Um, yeah, I think that's it. Okay. Yeah, brilliant. So it's, um, it's ironic, given that we're in the com communication business, that so little time is spent on interpersonal communication. It quite often feels as if we spend more time um, communicating with complete strangers than, than between ourselves. There can be a great tendency to avoid those difficult conversations. And relationship problems often stem from a lack of effective communication. Uh, with couples, um, the background, what, what lies under the surface or is hidden away, almost always drives the, the foreground. Um, so what is not said often stays that way because of an inability to have open, honest and direct communication. One good account handling technique is called the, um, the, the call list, which can help towards this. This involves listing all of the clients you deal with on an Excel spreadsheet, ranking them by order of preference in the adjacent column, so you have the, your most favorite client at the top and your least favorite client at the bottom. Once you're sure that you've got all of those clients on the list, everyone you deal with, then um, turn the list upside down by resorting the adjacent, the preference column from high to low. Now your least favored client is at the top of the list. Um, this now becomes your weekly priority call list. So every week, be sure to call those people that are at the top of the list, your least favored clients, before the others. It, it's human nature to want to avoid speaking, to having those conversations that we find the most um, difficult or we anticipate the most difficult. But the very act of avoidance gets in the way of building, building a relationship. By the way, that's particularly in client agency relationships. There's a predominance of two personality types which tend to occupy the advertising marketing services arena and they are success oriented personality types and pain avoidant personality types. Both want to avoid the difficult conversation. Okay? You're probably, a majority of you will be fall into one of those two camps. Okay, so will your clients. As a natural tendency, you'll want to avoid that kind of difficult conversation. It's not a judgment, it's just what it is. So using this list can help you overcome your natural and slightly heightened resistance to doing the difficult calls first. And believe me, in therapy we use this uh, as part of CBT and we're working with individuals that find it difficult to change. Put the difficult task first, make yourself a reward, do it, you'll feel a hell of a lot better and actually the business will get better. We've noticed that the ease of email communication has reduced the appetite for phone calls or face-to-face uh, -face meetings. Um, often when we advise agencies to call or meet with their clients to resolve a particular issue, uh, we will then find that they've tried to deal with it through email and wondered why it hasn't had the uh, desired outcome. I mean, email ne ne negotiations are fraught with um, uh, misunderstanding both because emotion and tone are very difficult to convey and because the email sender can uh, neglect the other person's perspective. Generally, we overestimate how accurately other people decode our, our tone. And this deficiency is particularly pronounced with, with email. Uh, emailers will tend to hear the tone that they um, intend to convey, but they will forget that the recipient um, is not privy to that all-important information. So here's a top tip for you. Whenever you have to communicate anything more than basic information, pick up the phone. And if you have to do it but through email, be sure to read that email out loud to yourself before you send it, because then you will have a better understanding of how your recipient will uh, interpret it. We've been socialized to avoid full disclosure We've learned that in order to get on with others, uh, it is better not to express our truth in the moment. Many of you will have seen the film Liar Liar when the central character is unable to lie for, for 24 hours. As a result, he constantly finds himself in difficulty uh, because the truth is often not socially acceptable. Most of us have thoughts running through our heads that we need to modify in order to avoid causing offense with, uh, with others. But this can lead us holding back and not revealing how we really feel. Regrettably, in relationships, small things can remain buried. And those small things can add up to bigger, t bigger things. Over time, what is unsaid then becomes unsayable. 
what is unsayable then becomes a barrier to, um, to contact, real contact between the couple. And the lack of real contact can lead to a loss of intimacy, which in turn increases the barrier. Between agencies and clients, um, the unsaid is often destructively powerful. I, I was once doing some consultancy work with a large financial organization and was invited in on their um, agency meeting. The meeting was very cordial, but I was surprised after the agency left at how critical the client was about the agency and, and the work. Um, and I asked the client team why they hadn't given this feedback directly to the agency. And they said, well, it would be, it, it'd be difficult for us to fee be that direct. And they also said that all our training has told us we need to give positive feedback to, <laughs> to the agency. So the net of this was that the agency left the meeting thinking that the client liked their work um, <laughs> and that they had had a good meeting. But the reality was that the client didn't like their work and felt negatively towards the team. Um, you know, this conversation was one of the reasons that led Paul and myself to setting up the client relationship consultancy. Withholding the truth happens, you know, withholding the truth happens all the time and it can adversely affect the client agency relationship. We once interviewed a client um, why, about why she had withheld from giving feedback from the agency and she said, I had nothing good to say, so I didn't say anything. This kind of response emphasizes the necessity of listening not just to what is being said, but also to what is not being said. Pay attention to the dog that's not barking, because that's the one with the most painful bite. There can be a tendency for advertising people, many of whom are extrovert and like to hear the sounds of their own voices, to feel that they need to present to and talk at their clients. Listening is often an afterthought and comes in the, in the form of what we term already listening. When you've invested so much time and energy in developing an idea in which you feel passionately, um, you will be desperate for signs that your client also likes that idea. In, in such situations, it's almost impossible to properly listen to both what your client is saying and what she's not saying. You'll be already listening for the buying signals and deaf to anything that doesn't support what you want to hear. As, um, as former United Nations General Secretary and um, Nobel Peace Prize winner Kofi Annan once advised, you have to listen not only to what is being said, but also to what is not being said, which is often more important than what they say. So when you listen to your clients, ask yourself, what is the dog that's not barking? When your client gives you positive feedback about the planning department, ask yourself, why are they saying nothing about the creative department? In fact, don't just ask yourself, ask them. <coughs> the following feedback is uh, from a client a few years ago. Um, she said, overall, it is a pleasure to work with the talent and passion at the agency. Love the work that is generated and produced. It's a very young and enthusiastic team. So where's the dog that's not barking here? What would this prompt you to ask your client about? It might interest you to know that six months after leaving this feedback, this client appointed another agency. Any ideas? Anybody else? No, it's in the... Yeah, yeah it's in the, it's the seniority area. Um, so there's a clue in the word young. Uh, three months later and shortly before firing the agency, um, she, she gave this feedback which is everyone on the account is very enthusiastic. However, they are also very young and sometimes struggle with marketing to a customer they cannot relate to. I feel that as a client we're leading the agency and therefore the brand is not gaining momentum in keeping ahead of the marketing and customer curve. So it's very easy to say with the benefit of hindsight, but if the agency had checked in with the client on how she felt about having a young team on the business when she gave that earlier feedback, they might have been able to head off the issue that ultimately led to them losing the business. Young was a very particular word for, them to, for, for her to have used in that earlier feedback. So the agency could have probed by saying, um, I'm delighted to hear that you value our talent, passion and our work, but I wanted to check whether there's anything that's missing for you. 
And if she said nothing, if she said it's all fine, as clients will often do, they could have said that I see you commented on the youth of the agency. Can you tell me more about your experience of that? How do you feel about having such a young team? Another similar experience came from a workshop that Paul and I resolved to help, help <coughs> ran to help resolve a troubled agency client relationship. One exercise involved getting both sides to disclose their background, i.e. to be honest about how they truly feel about each other. Um, in the safe environment that we'd created, the client team felt able to disclose that they felt patronised by the agency. They said the agency felt made them feel like out-of-town hicks. In turn, the agency were able to disclose that they always felt criticised by, by the client. Both the agency and client teams were amazed to hear this feedback. Previously, you know, they had both felt they could never have said how they felt, or certainly how they felt in that way, to each other. The client never told the agency they felt patronised, and the agency never told the client that they'd felt criticised. And yet this was how they both felt, and it drove how they behaved with each other. It was the root of all of their problems. Once disclosed, the relationship was transformed. The agency became more aware of how they presented themselves to the client and, and were able to modify uh, their, their behaviour. And the client became more aware of how they gave feedback to the agency. The most important lesson that they both learned was not, that not only that they could both give honest and open feedback to each other and that the other party could take it, but the very act of doing so brought them closer, closer together. And um, uh, just, just to bring in something from, from an outside world, what we know in um, the world of therapy and organisational psychology is that when we study levels of trust between individuals, they're much deeper and much stronger if a reciprocal disclosure has taken place. This fantastic guy called Girard uh, in the state spent his, uh, his time studying this amongst his colleagues at universities. And he found that, you know, if I disclose my stuff to you, you're more likely to disclose your stuff to me. And that mutual reciprocal disclosure lowers the water line between us and that leads to trust and so you can use this between yourselves and your clients discreetly you know, you know kind of say everything about your personal life um, but at a, a level being uh, honest and open about what's going on and that might be from the adult to adult rather than the child being honest and open about what's going on on a piece of work or what's happening, you know, within certain boundaries can be really useful to build trust rather than to build that veneer which leads to a lack of trust and that's often what clients <coughs> complain about. So By the way, I just want to, sorry, I'm going to go off piece again. Okay. Just one other thing. I'm, I'm realising as, as we stand here that many of you will be younger than your client counterparts. That's not because you're inexperienced, you don't have the relevant qualifications, but just that advertising is a younger business and working with clients, they're often much older. So this can be more difficult to build effective working relationships. I was dealing with a, with a uh, business director in the States recently who works with a much, much older woman. And the difference between this older, slightly dowdy woman and this polished West Coast woman working in, in New York was considerable. So relationally it becomes more difficult. So this notion of disclosure about what's happening can be really, really useful trying to bridge this gap between the ages. Sorry, back on piste. So uh, feed, feed forward or feedback is the lifeblood of relationships. Um, we found the following four questions, which we call the feed forward questions, to be particularly effective towards eliciting constructive and comprehensive uh, feedback about an idea or, or in fact anything. So we call them feed forward because they move, feed into the next iteration. So the questions are, what inspires you about this idea? What in particular works about this idea? What is missing from this idea? And what would make this idea bigger and better? And the wording is a bit clumsy, but it's a very good way of finding out how someone really feels about an idea, while at the same time enrolling them towards helping build and improve that, that idea.